uh, this is a critically important part of our democratic process, not to just show up in November and choose between two candidates and two parties, but to choose the uh, you know who the nominees are going to be of the two parties. So I. I think we have a lot of people going to show up, uh, and that's a, a priority of mine, is to educate people about the importance of voting, whether they want to vote for me or for Senator Smith, or whoever they want to vote for, show up and vote. Where do you think she's vulnerable? Well, I have my disagreements with Senator Smith, so I will just uh, I will say what I think on the issues. I'd like to see Senator Smith articulate a position on health care. I want her to debate me. I've asked for a debate several times, and, and so far, no go. But I want her, I, I will fly to Washington to debate her if she doesn't have time to come here, I debate her here. I think it's very important to have debates. Uh, that's a critically uh, a helpful way to overcome the influence of money in politics. Because then instead of running a bunch of TV ads, uh, which don't really say anything, uh, you'd have candidates actually debate the issues and go up on the internet and people would watch the debate whenever they wanted to. The, uh, the Twin Metals mod, Walter Bondale wrote an op-ed a New York Times, I think it was, uh, talking about copper nickel mine near the boundary waters, which he's categorically against. But I, I gotta say, I think the DFL, you know, anybody is gonna look terrible if they say, well, it's okay if it spills into the Duluth watershed, yeah, but not okay in the boundary waters. I mean, it's safe or it's not near navigable waters. And I think it's unsafe. The engineering reports say it's unsafe. So I'd hope the Army Corps of Engineers, you know, that they bail us out on this, but I just don't. I don't want to trust the system. So I want to fight this every step of the way. Well, I would do the best I could. <laughs> and I, I think that I just would do the best I could to do a good job here. And uh, Paul Wellstone, by the way, ran a wonderful ad when uh, uh, was it, uh, uh, his opponent wouldn't, um, uh, wouldn't debate him and refused to debate. And he was running all over looking for him uh, as a wonderful ad. So I think debates are critically important. That's the point that Paul Wellstone made. He followed pretty well. Yeah. What do you think of uh, Schumer and... Uh, Pelosi's comments on Maxine Waters. You know. Well, you hear what I'm talking about? Well, uh, they say she's supposed to go be a nice girl now and quit complaining. Well, I would prefer that the conversation focus on what Congress can do about President Trump. Are you, are you and, critical of Maxine Waters? Well, I think that the what I find that it would be somewhat difficult is that we have these uh, the sort of people going in the directions that aren't helpful. Senator Smith, on the one hand, criticizes me for wanting to impeach Donald Trump or have the hearings. And she says that's not helpful. I think that's what Congress's job is, which they did in 1973. I don't know that a, a member of Congress uh, you should be encouraging people to protest as opposed to convene a meeting of the House Judiciary Committee immediately to look at the multiple uh, violations of the United States Constitution by President Trump, Vice President Trump, Pence, and others in the administration. So I think it would be better if people in Congress, at least the Democrats and some of the Republicans might join and focus on what their duty is and their duty is to convene these hearings of the Judiciary Committee and investigate you know, what's going on and nothing's happening and so I think that's where I'd like to see the energy. What about, you think the red hand people should have thrown the Sarah out? <laughs> I well, I I think they have the legal right to, but I don't. Why did like she drive 170 miles? <laughs> no idea what happened there. My view on on restaurants is, uh, you know, I particularly am concerned about discrimination against the uh, uh, same-sex couples and, and others. You try to drive from here to Atlanta, Georgia, and you're you know, uh, uh, two men who just got married or whatever. You want to? You should be able to eat anywhere you want. <laughs> and I've said they ought to add a gender identity identity and sexual orientation to the Civil Rights Act of 1965. Uh, you know, I wouldn't add political affiliation there, but I, I gotta say as a matter of principle, I think if you're at a restaurant, you ought to just serve everybody. And I certainly do think the gender identity and sexual orientation ought to be protected by federal law. Yeah, this is a political issue. And that was political, and I wouldn't protect well, my black, it by law, but I don't think it's right. I would not, I don't think a restaurant owner should. My black activist friends say we gotta make people uncomfortable. Yeah, I just think on the restaurant thing that the, um, we've had too many problems of African Americans, despite the Civil Rights Act of 1965, being treated unfairly in restaurants, being asked for 
uh, to pay in advance of a meal and be given uh, other harassing treatment that I don't think it's helpful for those who support equal rights to go down the road of encouraging any restaurant anywhere to discriminate against a customer on any basis. I think that's counterproductive is going to is going to backfire because once again you've got a lot of homophobic and racist uh, restaurant owners and you know various places and uh, anybody should be able to travel across this country to any part of this country walk into a restaurant and know they're going to get served and treated with dignity and respect but once again I would not give legal protection to people's political views so you certainly have the legal right to throw someone out if you don't agree with their politics you I just don't think it's right it's not really polymath it's Glencore is the company that stands behind this operation and Glencore controls Polymet. Polymet is a Canadian company that's going to build a mine here. Uh, but Glencore has a third of the stock, they have the debt, and most important, they have a right to what comes out of the ground uh, from uh, uh, when they get that copper nickel mine going. About 1% of what comes out of the ground is the copper nickel or whatever the metals they want. The other 99% is just left here to sort of go into the water. And that's what happens here, the pollution. It's a mess, sulfide mining. And we've never done this in this state. We do talconite mining, which is iron mining, and that's our mining tradition on the iron range. It's not called the copper nickel range, and that's for a reason. We haven't tried this before, and it's potentially an environmental, will be an environmental catastrophe. These people, a Glencore, is a Swiss company started by Mark Rich, who was this guy who got a pardon from President Clinton some 20 years ago. That's not one of the more commendable pardons from President Clinton. Um, and uh, now you've got a number of characters behind that. I think Mark Rich was out of it, but then um, Ned Ronschild is a billionaire in London who has a lot of mines all over the world, including one called Indomet, which was a disaster over in Indonesia, an environmental disaster. He is a partner with, among other people, Tony Hayward. Tony Hayward, he got into a partnership with, after Tony Hayward had to leave British Petroleum, because he is Tony Deepwater Horizon Hayward. Remember him? Yeah. Um, and he got booted out of BP, went back to London, teamed up with <coughs> Matt Rothschild, and they were doing Iraqi oil deals. And then Rothschild recruited him to lead Glencore as the chairman of Glencore. So now Tony Hayward, with his wonderful environmental record, is in charge of, of, of Glencore. Um, and then uh, you have over here, Ivan Glassberg is the CEO. And he is originally from South Africa, but he's got a good friend here, uh, Mr. Putin. Uh, and he has received the uh, Presidential Medal of Friendship from Russia. And one of the big investors in Glencore is Oleg Deripaska. Yeah, yeah. He is the Russian oligarch under sanction. Uh, he is also a friend of, of Russia. They have some story in the British press. They're sitting on a yacht together, and they're talking about bribing a British a member of parliament, and they start suing each other when they're accusing each other of being the one who said they were bribing the member of parliament. It's a nasty story. But this, that was a number of years back. So we got Oleg Deripaska in there. He's a client of Paul Manafort. Now he's under sanctions, so they're very quickly trying to unwind all the financial relationships between Glencore and Oleg Deripaska. And I have to say, I don't think Donald Trump would be putting any more justices in this court. He is not able to or willing to uh, perform his duties as president has set forth the United States Constitution in multiple respects. Uh, but if he were to nominate anyone else to this court, if he's still in office, uh, it's extremely important uh, that the Senate uh, Judiciary Committee uh, ask very tough questions and get answers. I'm sick and tired of this answer that you always get, well, I don't want to rule out a future case. And then they say, well, you know, abortion, well, Roe versus Wade, come on, it's 45 years old. <laughs> and now we're getting into a situation where we have some decisions of this court. There are five, four decisions uh, with which many, many Americans categorically disagree. And today's decision on a travel ban is one of them. Citizens United is another. And I'm just going to tell you, if I'm on the Senate Judiciary Committee, I'm going to want to answer those questions under all. I don't want to hear that. I'm not going to talk about future cases. We'll find a vote against you. And that's just the way it's going to be.